Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. We're going to do things a little bit differently today because uh, we're going to talk about uh, T cell lymphoproliferative disorders. And uh, we we had some live sort of glass slides that related to this, but um, a lot of these we just didn't have some really good examples of some of the stuff. So we have a I have a lecture that I created a while back that has got uh, virtually all of these entities in here that I really want to share with you. Um, and when we're looking at cutaneous lymphomas, by far the most common that we do see are the T cell lymphomas. So we're going to really talk mostly about that today. We'll talk about the B cell lymphoid lesions in another lecture, another talk, but uh, the T cells are the ones you're gonna see by far the most commonly. And of these, obviously the most important one is mycosis fungoides. Um, we see this uh, differential diagnosis come up in our practice almost every day. Um, and you have to have good criteria to make the diagnosis. Um, it can sometimes be frustrating to make the diagnosis. Sometimes it takes more than one biopsy, but it really takes good clinical pathologic correlation. And if you have good correlation and you use some of these criteria that, we use all these criteria that I'm showing here, if these things are present, um, you can make the diagnosis fairly quickly. It, people say, oh, the average thing in the literature says you have to do six, seven biopsies to make it. That's really not true if you know what you're doing. Um, that's really almost kind of a... Uh, a back door. You don't really need six or seven biopsies in the vast majority of cases of MF. And especially when you got clinical lesions that look like this, especially the one on the right, that those kind of uh, round, somewhat, uh, they're not, some of them are kind of reniform, the one down maybe about six o'clock right here. You just kind of see those kind of lesions. There's some asymmetry in the waistband, the buttock area is a real common site, area where the skin is um, not exposed to the sun. The left one would be a lot more challenging if you just had something like that. Xerotic dermatitis can look like that. So a lot of things can look like that, but the one on the right is, would be a good example. And we see a biopsy that looks like this, a patchy infiltrate. When we say patchy, we mean uh, basically it's sort of like involves a little bit of an area here, spares an area, a little bit more of an area. Um, with this epidermotropism, where the cells are present singly at the basal cell layer and slightly above it without significant amount of spongiosis. That's just really very, very suggestive in the context of clinical of, of MF. If I saw this plus clinical, I would call it patch stage MF. I wouldn't call it atypical lymphoid infiltrate with epidermotropism. I would call this straightforward patch stage MF so the patient can get treated. If you try to do gene rearrangements on something like this, it's going to be negative because it doesn't have enough cells in there to be a positive, uh, get enough DNA and, and genetic material out to, to do the test. So you have to rely on clinical correlation. When you see these kind of findings, it, it's diagnostic. The cells in the epidermis are a little bit large. They're a little bit hyperchromatic. So uh, that's helpful. But the cytology is not the main thing here. It's clinical pathologic correlation with those findings. If you see a late stage lesion of mycosis fungoides where the skin be becomes atrophic, they get telangiectasia, they get atrophy, they get the cigarette paper wrinkling of the skin. And when you biopsy that, you'll see this fibroplasia in the papillary dermis with these thick collagen metals with a variable amount of, of exocytosis. So these are two patients with MF. The one on the left's got that nice poikiloderma. Uh, so whenever you see poikiloderma, you should put mycosis fungoides in the differential diagnosis. It may not be that, but it's certainly something to think about. The one on the right, I uh, see just a lot of that atrophy there. So that cigarette paper atrophy, and that correlates with an alteration in the papillary dermis, like you see here, the dilated blood vessels, the thick collagen bundles, and notice that there's still exocytosis in this specimen here. So once again, we have something like this and notice the virtual absence of spongiosis, a greater number of lymphoid cells than spongiosis, that balancing, that ratio favors mycosis fungoides when you have something like this. So if I saw this too, in the context of a good clinical information and, and photograph like that, I wouldn't hesitate. I'd make the diagnosis. And we unfortunately get uh, patients get sent to tertiary referral centers. We make the diagnosis of MF. And then they, they basically downgrade it to a nonspecific diagnosis. And, and to me, that doesn't help the patient. So if you wait until the patient got tumors or whatever, uh, or if you have to have genetic abnormality to make the diagnosis, you're doing the patient a disservice because if you treat them at this stage of the game, you can cure them in many cases. You can make the, the process go away. You certainly take care of a lot of their symptoms because these patients are often pretty pruritic. But notice there's atypicality of these cells or hyperchromatic, they vary in size and shape. So you don't really 
need those other things to make a diagnosis of, of MF here. There are a lot of synonyms for MF. If you go back into the, into the literature, and uh, in the old days, back in the 1700s, 1800s, um, they used to use the term parapsoriasis. And para means near is what it means. So you remember like in, uh, uh, back when you did organic chemistry, they talk about uh, para location of, of, of uh, methane structures, the CH3s on a benzene ring, you know, para uh, location there, meta and para. Well, it means near psoriasis. So it's not really a diagnosis. It means that it looked like psoriasis, but back in the old days, they didn't have really good criteria for mycosyringoides, so they used to call it parasoriasis. And they also used to call pterosis lichenoides uh, parasoriasis also, because it looked kind of like psoriasis clinically and maybe histologically. So it's a crappy name. Don't use it. It basically means you don't know what you're talking about. So most cases of so-called parasoriasis are really mycosis fungoides, that in, is basically using history to make a diagnosis. So you don't need it anymore. So when somebody says, well, it looks like parasoriasis on plaque or looks like parasoriasis, I usually say, well, you really don't know what you're talking about. It's really basically a, a variant of mycosis fungoides. So we don't really use the term parasoriasis anymore uh, in, in my opinion. And I don't really think it's a good diagnosis to use because it's confusing. You can make a specific diagnosis. You don't need parasoriasis. So when mycosis hangs around longer, it starts getting thicker and then you start getting plaques. So it progresses from patches to plaques to nodules and tumors. Sometimes it goes from patches to erythroderma, total body involvement. It doesn't always go through patch, plaque, nodule, tumor stage. Uh, sometimes it goes to patches and then it kind of regresses and looks like, looks like pitoris, it looks like a uh, uh, portoderma. So it can, it's kind of a, a, it's a dynamic disease. It tends to have a, it can either have a real slow progression or it can have a fast progression in some cases. But uh, this is the progression where it goes from patches to plaques. And here you just obviously get more in duration. Uh, the lesions get thicker. They start looking like this. So again, these are not patches anymore. These are plaques. And uh, so you can see in some areas, it's still kind of a patch here. And then that's got a little bit thicker more in duration, and so it's forming these plaques. And this sort of reniform, arsiform pattern is very characteristic of, of mycosis fungoides. We see that. So there's a biopsy of plaque stage disease. It's got a dense band-like infiltrate now, almost like an infiltrate, not really truly lichenoid, because you can still see the dermoepidermal junction. So if it's really and truly lichenoid, it should, it should totally obscure the dermoepidermal junction. We don't have that here. We've got a band-like infiltrate, lots of cells with epidermotropism with, again, very limited amount of spongiosis. So usually mycosis mongoides, there's a greater number of lymphoid cells. And some of those cells you can appreciate are frankly atypical in the epidermis. They don't have to be strikingly atypical. You know, that's a neoplastic cell there also. And that's not as atypical as this one. But all of these are are cancer cells in here. So they're not inflammatory cells. Is, these are all the cells of MF. And if you look down here, you know, you got some smaller cells that really aren't that atypical. That's still mycosis fungoides. They tend to be a little larger within the epidermis and in the dermis, but, but they don't have to be. But that's one thing to think about. And then as time goes on, they can form nodules and tumors. They can get uh, lymphadenopathy. Uh, you can get uh, necrosis on moss in these lesions. So obviously, if you wait until this time to make the diagnosis of mycosis fungoides, you you know, pretty much have done a major disservice to your patients. You make it earlier than this. You don't really need to get the tumor stage before you make the diagnosis. So here you've got a, a thicker nodular infiltrate of these cells, and you've got these obvious potriase collections. So if you wait until you get potriase collections to make the diagnosis of mycosis fungoides, you're going to be waiting around a long time. And there's good treatment for MF now, so it's better to make the diagnosis early, get the patients treated so they don't go to a stage like this, at which point it's harder to treat. So just like anything else, uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's better to get it when it's in an earlier stage. And these are beautiful potriase Microabscesses are not really abscesses at all. They're, they're collections of these atypical lymphoid cells that get convoluted up here. Um, and that's why they were called abscesses years ago, because they were convoluted and kind of looked a bit like neutrophils, but they're not neutrophils. And uh, you don't really need these to make the diagnosis. You got them, it's, it's great, but you certainly don't need the diagnosis. Th there's a lot of other um, sub types histologically of mycosis fungoides. We kind of go through some of these with you uh, now. Um, and uh, there's one type that can give you more of a perivascular and interstitial pattern. 
uh, can kind of almost look like a spongiotic dermatitis, can have a relatively limited amount of epidermotropism. So these could be tougher to diagnose. Clinically, pretty nonspecific. And you know, that looks a lot like xerotic dermatitis. I, 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 maybe you should maybe think about MF when you see something like this, but this is clinically obviously not diagnostic in MF. We look at it on the microscope, it kind of looks almost like a lymphocytic infiltrate. And the cells are a little bit atypical. There's a little bit of F dermatropism. You really have to have a high index of suspicion in a case like this to even think about MF here. So this really requires clinical correlation and, and something like this, you might really have to do gene rearrangement studies. I, I just don't think you can make a definitive diagnosis of MF in this situation. You just have to realize that it's one pattern you can see sometimes in MF. And, you know, some of these cells are a little bit atypical in here, a little convoluted. So uh, it, it really and truly was MF in this patient. And the patient actually did end up having a, uh, I think had, had circulating cesare cells, I believe. It was a, a case of, that actually was relatively aggressive. And sometimes these sort of subtle forms can be somewhat um, unusual and somewhat aggressive. Uh, erythrodermic MF, uh, cesare syndrome, which is a leukemic form of MF. They have circulating abnormal uh, cells here. Uh, they tend to have a high CD4 to CD8 ratio. You get loss of some of these markers and they're obviously clonality. If you look at the uh, the biopsy, you can give you this band-like infiltrate with relatively limited epidermotropism. So it's kind of two spectrums of MF, if you will. There's some types where you get lots of epidermotropism, we'll talk about it in a minute, with limited dermal involvement. And then somewhere you lose the epidermotropism and you have, uh, have circulating leukemia with MF. So the less epidermotropism, sometimes the worse the prognosis. So these patients get uh, total body erythroderma. So it's one of the things in the differential diagnosis of erythroderma. They often get uh, palmo plantar involvement. These two guys at the bottom actually also had tumors uh, associated with the erythroderma. You don't have to have that. The guy on the upper left just had widespread erythroderma. The diff different diagnosis there obviously includes psoriasis, PRP, severe atopic dermatitis, other things that can give you an erythroderma. But this is the biopsy. You notice it's got that dense band-like infiltrate of these cells and higher magnification. Uh, a lot of these are, are atypical and pleomorphic. And uh, this one's got, you know, a couple of nuclei here. So these are very variable in size and shape. But notice the virtual absence of epidermotropism. So you lose the epidermotropism with Cesare syndrome. You still have the cells in the dermis, uh, but you lose the epidermotropism and then they get the circulating Cesare cells here with the right game sustain on the left and electron microscopy here on the right, demonstrating that really hyperchromatic convoluted nucleus that we see with the cells of, uh, of Cesare cells mycosis and goiti circulating. So it's a bad disease. It's a leukemic form of the disease. And, and you really want to make that diagnosis as soon as possible. Now, the flip side of that is where you get uh, lots of epidermotropism with relatively limited dermal involvement. And there's two types of this, the so-called Warren J. Collop form, and then the Ketron Goodman form. Uh, the Ketron Goodman form is a widespread form that's actually seen more with CD8 cells, interestingly enough. And that one actually can be more aggressive. The, the type that's uh, seen on the palms and soles, the uh, Warren J. Collop type, these may simulate a neoplasm, like an epithelial neoplasm, maybe Bowen's disease, or maybe like a basal cell or squamous cell. And they're usually relatively localized. You may get one or two areas. And so here's a biopsy of that. And it's called pagetoid reticulosis because it looks like Paget's disease because there's so many cells in the epidermis. So notice the relative paucity of cells in the dermis here. So it's almost the opposite of Cesare. You have lots of cells in the epidermis, few cells in the dermis, good prognosis as opposed to Cesare, few cells in the epidermis, lots of cells in the dermis and, and in the bloodstream and a very bad prognosis, but still the, the cells are atypical. So keep that in mind. And then the Ketra Goodman type is where you get lots of lesions, not just the palm and sole involvement. And those guys actually can have a, a more uh, guarded prognosis when you get a lot of lesions. And one other setting to remember MF is, is that you can get follicular mucinosis in MF. There's two forms of follicular mu mucinosis, um, or three forms. There's the alopecia mucinosa type that's often seen in children that's not associated with MF. And then there's type that can be reactive. Sometimes you see patients with contact dermatitis or rosacea get follicular mucinosis. And then sometimes you get this, where you get follicular mu mucinosis and mycosis and goides. And uh, this is one where you really want to pick this up kind of earlier rather than later. So here's an example. Notice she's got uh, two lesions here on her face, the eyebrow lesion and the area around her eye and the lower uh, eyelid there. And then this person that had all these, these nodular lesions, she actually was sort of a, 
a sad case on, on the right, um, she'd come in with this widespread eruption with these follicular spiny papules have been called keratosis pilaris for about 10 years. And then she started popping up with these nodules and tumors. And then finally the diagnosis of MF was made. And you can see the, the lesions can look like uh, keratosis pilaris, like phrenoderma, things of that nature. You have to keep this in the back of your mind whenever you see uh, spiny follicular papular lesions on a patient, it, it should be in the differential diagnosis and it should be high in the, in the differential diagnosis. So you see something like this, you pretty much always want to consider taking a biopsy. And then this is what it shows. It shows mucin within these uh, follicles. And uh, sometimes it's just a little bit of mucin. Sometimes it's a lot of mucin like here. And then you get uh, the uh, neoplastic cells are present within the epithelium here. And then you also get uh, some some, you can get some spongiosis as well as the mucin, and then you also get a lot of eosinophils in the infiltrate, interestingly enough. And this is an area off to the side which shows the atypical lymphoid cells here, uh, pretty dense nodular aggregation of them in this other area away from the follicle. So always think of, of MF when you have follicular mucinosis. Now, you don't want to overdiagnose it either. I mean, if you get a five-year-old kid that's got a plaque of alopecia mucinosis in their face, you don't want to trigger the concern about MF in a situation like that because that's that's really rare. But uh, you do want to at least always think about it whenever you get follicular mucin and then look around, scroll around, find other areas. Maybe you'll see an area like this with some epidermotropism in the atypical cells. That's really, really helpful if you see that in the context of follicular mucinosis. Occasionally, uh, MF will uh, localize to the sweat glands syringotropic MF, and this is also another relatively aggressive variant of mycosis pinguinis. So once again, uh, this uh, if you saw something like this, they're sort of spiny little papules. And in this case, instead of involving follicles, these were involving sweat glands. So uh, you want to think about the diagnosis here. And this biopsy, again, it's got this band-like infiltrate superficially with epidermotropism. So I think if you just had a, a biopsy of this area here, you'd still should consider the diagnosis. But notice that it's also involving the uh, sweat glands beneath. So here, classic, typical MF superficially, but now also involving the sweat glands. And so whenever you get MF that's involving deeper structures, follicles, sweat glands, uh, losing the epidermotropism, think that it may be becoming more aggressive. And those are the patients who really want to make the diagnosis of as soon as possible. And uh, that's not going to respond to PUVA and topical nitrogen muster. Those patients need to be seen in conjunction with an oncologist and they need to be on some kind of a, a more uh, aggressive medication. And there are other systemic medications that we can use for MF that actually have pretty good therapeutic efficacy. Sometimes you'll get MF with a lot of histiocytes in the infiltrate and it develops a granuloma to cystology. And as opposed to the last few examples where the prognosis can be more aggressive, here, interestingly enough, the prognosis is less aggressive. And uh, probably what's going on here is that the host is developing an immune reaction to these atypical lymphoid cells and bringing in histiocytes to destroy them. And you'll often see uh, histiocytes with these atypical lymphocytes in the cytoplasm. You'll still see in some areas, zones where there may be some more characteristic MF. You know, if you biopsied something like this on this guy, it probably would look more like uh, the psoriasis form MF with epidermotropism. These are going to look like nodules and tumors. But uh, here's another patient that had these areas that looked more like patch, plaque, disease. We biopsied these. They actually had granulomas in the infiltrate. And here's an example. Again, it's got the patchy band-like infiltrate with the epidermotropism. So you would think about the diagnosis of MF if you saw something like this. But a lot of these cells obviously have more of a histiocytoid morphology. And uh, here's one that's multinucleated here with an atypical lymphoid cell in the cytoplasm. So we think what's going on here is that this is a host reaction to the MF that's coming in and fighting it off and, you know, gives a paradoxically better prognosis. So there's an atypical convoluted lymphocyte sitting in the cytoplasm of this multinucleated histiocyte here. And in some cases, those granulomas uh, infiltrates can be so mag uh, large uh, that they can actually start engulfing um, uh, e uh, elastic fibers, and uh, they can be these very large, large multinucleated histiocytes with multiple nuclei within them, again, having these atypical lymphocytes within the cytoplasm. And uh, the elastophagocytosis results in a, a basically a slack skin and a trophic process. I'll show you that in a minute. And you get these 
pendulous folds of skin, usually in the intertriginous areas like you see here. This was an interesting patient we had a few years ago that had uh, sort of several different patterns of MF in her skin. She had a porcoliderminous pattern, as you see here. Uh, she also had other areas where the skin was more indurated. And uh, when we took a biopsy of one of those indurated areas, it showed this very dense infiltrate of these large uh, atypical uh, lymphoid cells in the infiltrate, but these large multinucleate histiocytes had engulfed these atypical lymphoid cells. And this was a, a patient that had this granulomatous slack skin syndrome. Uh, notice all of these very large atypical lymphoid cells with some of them in the cytoplasm here. This patient had been misdiagnosed as sarcoidosis for about five or six years before her diagnosis was made. And uh, fortunately she got on therapy, but uh, it was not a very good course for her because she had really had tumor stage MF that had this granulomas infiltrate. When we biopsied some of the porcelainous areas, excuse me there, she, it showed more classic features of MF here, this patchy infiltrate once again with the epidermotropism and the little collections in here. So she had, if you just biopsy this and you'd miss the granulomatous area, you would have called this mycosis fungoides. And then she had another area that showed more of the kind of granulomatous MF without these large granulomatous slack skin uh, multinucleated histiocytes that were engulfing the um, the lymphoid cells. And, and here you see the elastophagocytosis. So these histiocytes are coming in and gobbling up elastic fibers, like you see here, and then with the special stain. And then they get the pendulous folds of skin because they don't have any elastic fibers there anymore. And you get all this infiltrate in there and just kind of weights down and looks almost kind of like uh, the elephant man, if you will. So uh, remember that diagnosis as well. It's a relatively uncommon condition, but it's basically mycosis fungoides with infiltrates that result in these interesting clinical appearances to them. Now, lymphomatoid papulosis, kind of shifting gears a little bit, is another uh, T-cell proliferative disorder. There are some B-cell variants of MF, but the vast majority of them are T-cell uh, proliferations. And they usually, they can develop in multiple different patterns. There's lots of different variants of MF I'm not gonna, or, or lymphomatoid papulosis. I'm going to go over all of them with you today. But 15% uh, or so can be associated with an underlying lymphoma, either Hodgkin's disease, a key one CD30 positive lymphoma, or mycosis fungoides. And they can develop either before, during, or after the lymphoma. And then about another 15% of these will have vasculitis. Most of them are CD30 positive, but they don't have to be CD30 positive, but the vast majority of them are. And uh, this is kind of a clinical appearance. They can develop these widespread scattered individual crusted papules. They often can uh, be necrotic uh, in areas. Uh, and again, these are some of the, the general patterns that we can see. The uh, A and C type uh, tend to have CD30 positive staining. The D and E type are positive with CD8. Uh, the MF type can be CD30 positive and, and CD8 or CD4 positive as well. So it's not 100%, but some of these can give you an angiodestructive pattern. Some can give you ulceration. There's a couple of other patterns that have been described, but these are by far the most common patterns. Sometimes you get an agmenated appearance in the skin where they're kind of clustered in an area like this. And that's also a form of lymphomatoid papulosis. Here you see the uh, superficial and deep wedge-shaped pattern, very classic form that we see under the microscope and go to higher magnification. You can see the very large, uh, very atypical lymphoid cells here. And when they kind of look very large and anaplastic, like a, uh, basically really look atypical like that, uh, the cerebriform types, we think of the C type, the anaplastic type, the A type, the you know, whatnot. So those are, this would be maybe what some people might call the, the A type of lymphomatoid papulosis. And these can sometimes be associated with uh, Hodgkin's disease. So when they have these sort of cells that almost look like Reed Sternberg cells, they may actually have be associated with, uh, with Hodgkin's disease. So you have to always work these patients up. Beware that they may have uh, a manifestation of an underlying lymphoma when you get a diagnosis of lymphomatoid papulosis. The vast majority of them don't, but they can either develop a lymphoma some some point in the course or they can actually have lymphoma when they get when they get the diagnosis of lymphomatoid papulosis. Epidermal it's it's not a lymphoma really, but it is a T cell proliferative condition, and it can simulate mycosis fungoides. There can be an acute, subacute, and a chronic form. Um, the acute form, also known as plevo or Mukohabrin disease, the chronic form, uh, it's been called the Juliusberg, and again, some people used to call this parasoriasis of Juliusberg, and I don't really like the term parasoriasis, as I mentioned before. Uh, these generally, especially the pleva type, can give you these uh, ulcerating nodules, these ultranecrotic lesions. It can sometimes be associated with fever, systemic symptoms, can result in hospitalization, 
Uh, some patients can be really, really sick with that. Uh, that's relatively rare, but can be seen in some cases. So here's an example of that ulceronodular type, and, and these patients can be really, really ill. So this is the uh, Muka Haberman type that really almost looks like a variolaform, like uh, smallpox, if you will, because these are ulcerating lesions, and that's why it originally got that name. And here you see an example of that superficial and deep wedge shaped infiltrate with all this ballooning degeneration, epidural necrosis superficially. You can get uh, some atypical lymphoid cells in pityriasis lichenoides. You can get lots of epidermal tropas in pityriasis lichenoides, so it can simulate mycosis lymphoides, but it's not MF. And, and generally, these patients will get better over the course of time. Uh, it often can be a chronic process, especially if it turns into so-called pityriasis lichenoides chronica. And the acute form may need to treat with methotrexate, you got to treat these patients aggressively sometimes if they really get sick from that. So that's uh, pityriasis lichenoides. And then uh, chronic actinic dermatitis, again, can look like simulate mycosis fungoides, get these thick plaques on sun-exposed parts of the body, the face, neck, the trunk. Uh, African-American dark skin patients most commonly seen in the United States gives you a psoriasiform lichenoid process. Again, looks very much like this. And the most interesting thing about this process is when you biopsy it, it can really simulate MF. So this is an MF simulator, like a drug eruption can sometimes simulate mycosis lichenoides. Rarely long-standing contact dermatitis can simulate MF. But you have to think about this and make sure that you don't overcall it, mycosis lichenoides. And these patients, if you say, well, we're going to diagnose it as a MF and stick them in a like box, they're going to get much worse as opposed to the treatment that, that you use for MF. So you just make sure you don't forget this diagnosis. So if you see something that looks like MF, it's in a sun-exposed area, your mycosis really should be in a sun-protected area, think about the diagnosis and uh, get these patients out of the light. And these patients, the action spectrum can be as, as, as high as visual light. Sometimes these patients become really cripples in society. They, they can't even go outside at all. They can only go out at night because their skin is, is just uh, flared up even by visible light, basically. There's a couple of types of lymphomas that don't give you the epidermotropism that we see with most T-cell lymphoid proliferations and the subcutaneous T cell lymphoproliferative disorders, really two types. There's the alpha beta and the gamma delta type. The alpha beta phenotype uh, is really a very good prognosis. And this one actually has been really almost reclassified as not even being lymphoma anymore. Um, it gives you CD8 positivity, cytotoxic proteins, CD30 and CD56 are negative. It has a very good prognosis, often seen in children. And so you have to kind of distinguish this from the gamma delta type that's far more aggressive. That's the one that's really uh, the more true lymphoma type. This, this lesion is really less aggressive. It can look like cellulitis, can look like these almost paniculitis-like lesions on this individual's trunk. And if you do a biopsy of these, the process is really situated in the panicula. So it's a lobular paniculitis, and you get these beanbag-like cells like you see here. They're kind of homing to areas of the lipocytes. And the cells look really pretty atypical, but um, it's really a, a benign, low-grade process. So when it's the alpha-beta type, they have a very good prognosis. When it's the gamma-delta type, um, they do a lot worse, and, and you have to be able to distinguish those, and you may need to do gene arrangement studies and immunophenotyping to determine which type you're dealing with. So those can look pretty much similar under the microscope, but you really need to, to do immunophenotyping to distinguish them. The primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, the key, key one or CD30 positive lymphoma, this is sort of almost think of it as like a, a giant lesion of lymphomatoid papulosis. These used to be called regressing atypical histiocytosis years ago because it's opposed, and they look bad under the microscope and they look bad clinically, but surprisingly, these patients generally tend to do pretty well, especially when they're primarily located in the skin, when they are ALK negative, uh, anaplastic lymphoma kinase negative, they tend to have a very good prognosis and actually can regress. So here you see an area that you might think of this as a lymphoma. It's got this pinkish purplish color with ulcerated. Uh, and you look at the biopsy, it's got this very sheets of atypical lymphoid cells say, oh my goodness, this really looks terrible. This patient's going to have a really bad prognosis. But surprisingly, when these are CD30 positive, and notice that they're eosinophils in infiltrate, which is common in the CD30 positive lesions also, they tend to do very well. So you just want to make sure these patients don't have lesions elsewhere. If they're ALK negative, again, they usually tend to 
or in the skin primarily in that situation. If they're ALK positive, they may have spread to the skin from an internal site, so it's valuable to do that stain. Uh, but you also may want to work the patient up just to make sure that they don't have any uh, evidence of disease elsewhere. There are a couple of uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphomas that can involve blood vessels and give you a vasculitis associated with it, the so-called angiocentric peripheral cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. You get these papules, nodules, and ulcers. They look like vasculitis uh, under the microscope, but they're actually a lymphoma. So if you saw this, obviously you'd be very worried about this being a lymphoma. Uh, interestingly enough, when this was biopsied, it's got this nodule or infiltrate in some areas, but notice these blood vessels are being targeted and damaged here. And there's a lot of these atypical lymphoid cells around these blood vessels here. So thrombose blood vessel, atypical lymphoid cells, think about this entity. Uh, and it's in the same spectrum of lymphomatoid uh, granulomatosis a little bit, which is another situation where you can actually get a granulomatous vasculitis in a lymphoma. So you can get vasculitis, vascular injury with lymphomas also, as even in T-cell lymphomas. So in this, uh, uh, this other condition, adult T-cell uh, leukemia lymphoma syndrome, these are often associated with an HTLV-1 uh, uh, infection and they can get multiple different clinical appearances. They can get papules, plaques, nodules, and tumors. They can get erythroderma. They get a morbilliform eruption. And they often, again, like Cesare syndrome, can get circulating cells. So this is a lymphoma leukemia syndrome here. This is a lady we had a number of years ago that presented with a febrile illness and developed all these little papules on her skin, again, looking similar to like the follicular mucinosis of uh, MF or, or maybe syringotropic MF. Uh, and uh, another patient that had more of a widespread eruption with a nodule and a tumor and then had these papules. And uh, when we looked at some of the microscope, it had this uh, dense infiltrate, somewhat band-like, but also a lot of these cells are present within the lumen of blood vessels. So this was a sign that this was uh, circulating. And notice she's got this epidermotropism here. The Notice the large number of the atypical cells uh, as opposed to spongiosis. So whenever you get a spongiotic focus, it's got lots of lymphoid cells in there. You should be thinking about the possibility of a lymphoma or mycosis fungoides. And this is the circulating cells that are present inside the blood vessel here. And notice how atypical these cells are, very strikingly atypical. Some of these cells almost look like uh, floret cells, they've been called. So this is adult T cell leukemia lymphoma that's associated with HTLV-1, and this is endemic in Asia uh, and, the, and in the Caribbean area, the United States, South Central uh, United States has this. So this lady that we saw was from Louisiana that had this condition, and she had a very high circulating 600,000 uh, white blood cells that were circulating in her, in her immune system, and so she unfortunately did, uh, died from that uh, condition. They also get hypercalcemia. Now, this is a different entity that's been called a CD4 small to medium sized pleomorphic T cell lymphoproliferative disorder. And it's probably not a true lymphoma, but notice that it, it says it's got a 60 to 80% survival. So, even though some of the things like the alpha beta uh, entity we talked about before has been reclassified as a non lymphoma, this one was thought to be lymphoma for a while that they sort of also sort of declassified as a, as a disorder because it's got a high survival. But you know, a lot of the B cell things that they're still calling lymphomas have a 99% five-year survival, and they still call them uh, marginal cells of lymphoma and things of this nature. So to me, even though we don't really call this a true lymphoma, you need to follow these patients because they, they may have some pop-up of lesions elsewhere. And uh, they often look like this. They come in with a solitary lesion. The head and neck area is a common location. Uh, so if you saw something like this, you should think of a lymphoma or possibly a pseudolymphoma, obviously. And uh, biopsy shows this dense nodular infiltrate of these cells that look pretty atypical. I mean, these are convoluted, uh, they're, they're pleomorphic. And so we see something like this, we might think it might be a, a variant of a lymphoma. It's usually relatively superficial, so it's not extending into the fat. So it's got a, it's, it's top heavy as opposed to bottom heavy. And they, again, even though they have this atypical pleomorphic morphology, they tend to look pretty, uh, they tend to do relatively well. So it's not MF, uh, it's a T cell lesion. And if you have CD4 staining uh, on that, it's gonna be positive also. Now, natural killer cell lymphomas, these really are not T cell lesions. So uh, I just threw them in here because they kind of uh, have been thought to be T cell lesions in the past. 
Uh, they will not have a T cell gene arrangement study because they, if you do a T cell gene arrangement evaluation on them, they're not going to be positive because they're not really T cells. But these lesions can be pretty aggressive. Um, they can often be seen in the nasopharynx area of Asians and South America. This used to be called lethal midline granuloma. These were often Epstein-Barr virus positive. Um, if you stain these, they're positive for CD2, for CD56, which is the killer cell marker. Uh, they're usually uh, CD43 positive, and they may not stain for, for CD3, so they're not usually considered a T-cell marker, but they do have these cytotoxic proteins in them. Rarely are they CD56 negative. But these are really bad lesions. I mean, they tend to involve this, this central facial area, and they get into the sinuses, and they cause all kinds of problems, and they usually end up killing the patient just by almost a local mass effect when they kind of erode down into the bone and, and get into the brain uh, tissue in some cases. So here's another example, kind of a grim uh, situation. You want to make this diagnosis as quickly as you can, obviously, and try to get them on some kind of a therapy. Um, here's a biopsy of one of these, just shows a dense diffuse infiltrate, and uh, there's really a little bit of epidermotropism, so you might confuse this with mycosis fungoides, but here's this ne necrotic area right here. These lesions do generally necrose. These are going to be the cells going to be highlighted with the natural killer cell, CD56 marker. Um, and again, you may get some, a little bit of epidermotropism here, so it may simulate mycosis fungoides, but it's a lot more aggressive uh, than mycosis fungoides. Another example, uh, this one's basically sheets of atypical cells with uh, staining strongly with the CD56 marker. So think of this tumor uh, in that setting. And then these are also positive with Epstein-Barr virus, as you can see here. Now there's another non-nasal type of this. Again, uh, these do not occur in Asian individuals necessarily. They can be seen anywhere. And usually uh, Epstein-Barr virus is not positive here. So uh, this lady had this uh, lesion. She was uh, not from an Asian uh, background, as you can see, and she had multiple lesions on the on the trunk, on the face, the extremities, and her biopsy again just showed this nodular infiltrate of these cells. And again, she had some epidermotropism. So the, probably the most important thing here is that it can simulate mycosis fungoides, but it's not MF. Uh, these cells again were highlighted with this CD56 phenotype that uh, was uh, documenting it was one of the CD56 positive. Uh, lymphoid neoplasms, and they're more aggressive than mycosis fungoides. Now, I include this lesion at the end because uh, this is a new, uh, there's something new about this entity. It's now been called, it's been renamed as this blastic plasma cytodendritic cell neoplasm. It used to be called CD456 positive hematodermic neoplasm or blastic NK cell lymphoma. We now know it's really not that entity. It's really actually in the hematolymphoid uh, origin. And one other marker that we now have found is positive in this entity is CD123. And the thing that's important about this is that there's a new uh, drug now that targets this tumor that gives a 100% response rate when it's initially uh, given to the patients when the diagnosis is made. So you want to make this diagnosis earlier rather than later because there's new treatment for this. It's a really good drug that's produced by a company called Stemline. So I, I, I do consult with them. And the reason I do is because I'm really excited that there's actually a new uh, drug now that we can treat this for. The mean time till diagnosis is six months. So you want to pick it up earlier than that if possible. And these patients can present in multiple different patterns. They can present with these sort of nodules like you see here, but they can also sometimes present as a non-healing bruise. And that's probably the most important. So if you see a patient comes with what looks like a bruise-like lesion, and you can see that with some of the cutaneous B-cell lymphoma, CD20 positive intravascular lymphoma can look like a bruise also. So sometimes these lymphomas don't present as purple nodules in the skin. They can present like a, a bruise that doesn't heal. Think about this entity, and it shows, again, just a nodular infiltrate of these atypical lymphoid cells. They're, again, not T cells here, but they do stain positively with this CD123 marker, CD4, and CD56. So I like to think of this tumor as basically a CD123456 tumor because it stains with these markers. And if you see a funny neoplasm that looks like a bruise and you're a dermatologist and you take a biopsy and you pick that up, you should tell your hematopathologist or your dermatopathologist, would you please think about staining it with these markers we had one here in our laboratory just about a month ago that no one had figured out. Nobody thought about it. We thought about it, did the stains, low blood was positive, all these things. They were able to refer the patient to oncologist. They're going to be treated with this new drug now that actually is going to make them have a very good, uh, at least initial 
uh, response to that. So uh, when there's good treatment for medic for diseases, we want to pick it up and diagnose it earlier and get them in the hands of the people who can administer those therapies as soon as possible. So um, it's a challenging subject. Uh, for you, the most important is just to know, you need to know everything there is to know about mycosanguinities. You, you know, the other ones are important too. You know, you might get a question on the board exam about some subcutaneous piculitis like T-cell lymphomas and things like that. But you definitely need to know everything there is to know about MF, patch, plaque, nodule, tumor, immunophenotyping, gene arrangements, treatment. So MF, we own that disease, dermatology disease, need to know about it, need to know how to diagnose and treat it. And I would recommend that you know something about lymphomatoid papulosis. So uh, this is our uh, Vail, Colorado, and uh, we're going to be heading up there this weekend and do a little skiing. But... Uh, that's, we have our conference there in the summer and maybe you guys at some point want to come and learn more about MF and other things like this at our conference. So uh, good luck with this. We'll be talking about the B cell neoplasms sometime in the near future. Um, thanks for attending and uh, we will see you uh, in the next lecture.